Uh, for you two, we're going to be dealing with the message to the believers at Philadelphia, and which is chapter 3, verses 7 to 13. And we'll read through uh, one verse each, starting at verse 7 with Tracy. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things say he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. I know thy works, and behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength. And has kept my word and has not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because <coughs> thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. Okay. Just looking at a few of the outlines, we have verse 7 being the prologue, verse 8, the praise, verse 9, the problem, 10, 11, there's a prospect, 12, the promise, and 13, the plea. For some of the others, we have um, 7, their warrior, 8, their works, 9, their warning, 10, and 11, their wage, 12, their winners, and 13, the wish. Or also we have the same breakdown, the opening, the omniscience, the omnipotence, uh, the obedience, the overcoming, the outcome. The alliteration, good work on that anyways. And the other we have um, addressing the church, vindication for faithfulness, retribution to hypocrites, remain faithful, rewards for the righteous, listen attentively. I'm starting to get it there for alliteration. We had three. That's good. So turning to our notes, number six. The message to Philadelphia. The city of Philadelphia itself, known in modern times of, as Allah Seher, which is, you can see broken down there, meaning Allah, which is... Uh, uh, Muslim for God and Seer city. This one means the city of God in Muslim. It's located in Lydia, some 28 miles southeast of Sardis, and was named after a king in Pergamos, Adelias Philadelphus, who built the city. The word Philadelphia, meaning brotherly love, is found in six other times in the New Testament. Uh, Romans 12, 10, you'll look that up, please, Tracy. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9. Hebrews 13.1, 1 Peter 1.22, and 2 Peter 1, 1.7a and b. Be kindly affectioned one toward another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. So that's Philadelphia again, toward one another. Okay. Thirteen one. <laughs> okay. First Peter one twenty two. Seeing that ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. And love's probably Philadelphia or Philios anyways. Second Peter one seven. Brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. Okay, so the Christian attributes were to grow in. 
Now here the word occurs for the seventh and final time, but only here is it used of a city bearing its name, rather than an attribute or a virtue. The city of Philadelphia had a long history, and several times was almost completely destroyed by earthquakes. The most recent building, rebuilding was in AD 17. The land area around Phil Philadelphia was rich in agricultural value, but had noticeable tokens of previous volcanic action. Grapes were one of the principal crops, and in keeping with this, wait, in keeping this, this was, this, keeping this, Dionysus is one of the chief objects of pagan worship. Uh, the Church of Philadelphia was weak, but it was wonderful. There was not the slightest hint of rebuke from the Lord. Nothing but praise is given. It was a revival church. It had world vision. The disruptive, deadening influence of those who would have snared the church with Judaistic ritualism and legalism have been overcome. The truth of the Lord's imminent return was its beacon light. Like the church at Smyrna, some, of, uh, some in this church said they were Jews and were not. This church was opposed by Satan. Satan is found in four of the seven churches. Um, in 2 9, 13, and 24, and also 3 9. They had the synagogue of Satan. There's little come, there's little come, condemnation, it should be, condemnation. The church was promised a crown. So it's just a little bit of introduction. Just make a reference to because we'll see that it comes up the um, the background also in the part it says Philadelphia was the feeble church the city was founded as read by Elias uh, was tended to make the Philadelphia center of Greco-Asiatic civilization. It means of spreading the Greek language and customs in the er eastern part of Lydian uh, Phrygia. Phrygia. It was a missionary city founded to promote the unity of spirit, customs, and loyalty within the realm. It was a successful teacher. Before AD 19, the native tongue had ceased to be spoken in Lydia, and Greek was the only language of the country. So it would be two years after the rebuilding, after the earthquake. The church in Philadelphia was mission-minded and dedicated. Also, Philadelphia commanded a key situation on the main line of communication between Rome and the central plateau of Asia Minor. Its strategic location made it possible for it to open or close these lines of communication. As you're going to see how the Lord says He wanted that this open and closes, as they would know about the door. So looking at the prologue, where it says, and... That's in your introduction notes. And we're going to come to it, about uh, the Lord opening and closing. Um, and to the church, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true. He is holy and true. He is so dazzling in his holiness that the shining seraphim before him hide their faces in their wings. He is so dependable that a man can stake everything on his word. Christ is preeminently the Holy One and the One who is always true. Such a one is qualified to call the Christians of Philadelphia to a life of faith in Him and a corresponding life of holiness, even as Peter wrote in 1 Peter 1 1 1.15. It states, But as He which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy, in all manner of conversation. He that is holy, we can also compare this to 4.8, where they say, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And we saw compared to 1 Peter 1.15 and up Isaiah 40.25, Tracy, Leviticus 11.44, Hebrews 7.26, 1 Peter 2.22 1 John 3.5 To whom then will you liken me, or 
Okay, the Holy One. 44? Yes, 1144. For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy. For I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with my, any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Okay, Hebrews 7.26. For such an high priest was fitting for us. Who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than heavens. Okay. First Peter two twenty two. Who did not sin, neither was guilt found in his mouth. Who did not sin, without sin. First John three. No sin. Mm -hmm. Neither was guile found in his mouth. First John three five. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Right. No sin. And Second Corinthians five twenty one. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And we'll forgo reading Mark ten. So he's the holy one. Also he is true. In Revelation six ten. And he cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Comparing to John 14.6, we know that is, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. John 17.3, Tracy, please. And 1 John 5.20. Are you still in 1 John 5.20, Helen? Easy enough to get there. Oh, okay. And this is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, and thou hast said. Say it again, please. And this is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, and thou hast said. Okay. And 1 John 5.20. And we know that the Son of God is come, and hath given us an understanding, that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This okay. is the true God, and eternal life. Okay, and as you see, as all the other churches, when the Lord Jesus introduced himself, whether it's uh, referring back to the revelation that he gave to John, or some new one, <clears throat> some new attribute of himself, it usually has to deal with the problem, or some form of encouragement for the believers in that church. Some characteristics showing that he is all in all. That all things are found in him, all things are through him. And here we have two things. First, that he's holy without sin is able to uh, uh, judge things by the standard of himself, and also that he is true, as we'll see that what his word says is, is truth itself. And it's important because, as we're going to see, going along with the background of the Laodiceans, they were known, I mean the Laodiceans, as Philadelphians, what they were going through and, and uh, their faithfulness to him will be built on this. On his character and on the, on the truth of it, and truly, like, like we had an introduction, that they could state their claim, he's going to ask them to continue on, and um, uh, he encourages them with that. Now, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. Christ, the great uh, antitype of Eliakim, has the key to truth and holiness as well as opportunity, service, and testimony. He has the key of David. The allusion is to Isaiah 22, 22. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open, and none shall shut. And he shall sh shut, and none shall open. And uh, it goes on with verse 20, And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and will clothe him with the, thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle, and will commit thy government into his hands. And it goes on, and finally, it's uh, prefiguring Christ. Where we're told of Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, had the key of the house of David, access to the treasuries of the king. He opens, and no man shuts, and shuts, and no man's open, as we saw. 
He said in, to John in 1.18, I have the keys of death and of Hades. Remember in the Revelation? I have the keys of death and Hades. Now he has the key of David. This announces royal claims as to as Lord and head of David's house and looks toward the kingdom to be established on earth. Uh, again, showing that he has the keys of David, also 9-1 in the book of the Revelation. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto earth, and to him was given the key, this is referring to keys, of the bottomless pit. There's one more key, and another one is in 20, verse 1. I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hands. Now Christ holds the key to the door of salvation, as we know, in, and also John 10, 9. He himself, what he holds. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. It's more than the key. He is the door itself, but the key to salvation. Christ holds the key to the door of service. In 1 Corinthians 16, 9. For a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries, says Paul. Also in... Uh, 2 Corinthians 2.12, can you read that please, Tracy? Colossians 4.3, Bev, and Acts 14.27, Claire. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and the door was opened unto me of the Lord. Okay, so the Lord opened it. Colossians. Uh -huh. <laughs> Read it again, please. I didn't get that. Praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds. Okay. The door of utterance. And also uh, Acts 14 27. Okay, talking about uh, oh, it was Peter when he uh, led uh, the centurion Cornelius to the Lord. And that was part of his ministry when he was given the keys. And uh, that was the last opening. So the keys. And it just continues the same thought about continuing with the works. He has the authority, the key of David. The Messiahship, that which is his kingdom, which establishes and shows, corresponds to Isaiah 22, 22. It shows that he's the one that has it. He's confirming that he's the one that has the keys. And also in the works, as we read some of the verses, how he, it actually goes out through experience. Uh, through the message <coughs> he opened. When we're praying, ask for a door of utterance. And we continue in verse 8 where, with his praise. He says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. Three times the Lord calls upon the church at Philadelphia to behold. As we'll see, it says, Behold, in verse 9. Also, the second part of verse 9 says, Behold, I will make them to come and worship. And then on verse 11, Behold, I come quickly. Behold. Gaze. Have a fixed gaze upon. Ramsey explains the reference to the door as arising from the geographical situation of the city of Philadelphia, a term that they would also understand, but we see this as a biblical one. Isaiah 22:22 is there a lot longer before uh, Philadelphia, but at the same time, it was something they would understand. Where Philadelphia lay in the upper extremity of a long valley, which looks back from the sea, after passing uh, Philadelphia, the road along this valley ascends to Asia Minor. 
this road was the one which led from the harbor of Smyrna to the northeastern part of Asia Minor and east in general, the one rival to the great route connecting Ephesus with the east and the greatest Asian trade route of medieval times. Philadelphia, Philadelphia therefore, was the keeper of the gateway to the plateau. And so another reason probably why it was even there, the king building it plus is very strategic. And a, a garrison there would always keep that door closed if necessary. How he opened and shut for the apostles in the early days, this door. And we read some of those passages, but we can read some more. Uh, Acts, um, I don't think we read this one. Acts 16, 6 to 10, Tracy. And eight, Acts 18, 9 and 10. And 19, we won't read 19 all the way, 8 to 20. But let's just read those two to get the idea. Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia, after they, came, after they were come to Mysia, they stayed to go into Bithynia by the Spirit, but the Spirit suffered them not. And they, passing by Mysia, came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And after I had seen the vision, immediately he endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Okay, so you see how he closed the door to a certain area, he opened it to another. And it's the Lord and the Holy Spirit that's in control. 18, 9, and 10. Then spoke the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. For I have many people in this city. Mm -hmm. So again, how the Lord opened to him. And it's interesting when we just think practically. I mean, we can have all the programs we want. It's the Lord who's ultimately in control. You know, and uh, he says, like, uh, I know a lot of times, it's bemoan, bemoan the fact that we haven't reached certain people groups and stuff. It's not that the Lord doesn't know. If the Lord really wanted them to know at a certain time, they would know. I mean, we don't limit the Lord in any any sense. But you could that's the old thing. Well, what about the pygmy in Africa that hasn't heard the gospel? Is he going to hell? Well, God has already given them the first degree of, of revelation of himself in nature. And if they don't go beyond that to the next step, uh, he doesn't send the next part, of which is the trust in Christ. They've condemned themselves. They've already set up their own God system. We know in uh, Hebrews 11, 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God first must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them to diligently seek him. And that's how it goes. You look at Cornelius. He believed that he was. Well, God sent him Peter because he diligently sought him and he got saved. Um, you think of the Ethiopian eunuch. It goes on and on. These ones who believe God will send the next stage, but he won't send more revelation that's necessary. He does it one step at a time. And people that reject even natural re revelation um, or the total existence of God as he is, they rejected him. And so the pygmy is condemned like any other person. Yeah, that's it. That's that's the first degree of revelation of himself, the first part of the gospel. He's God. And well, they would just understand that there's something greater than they that created all this. Right. That would all, that, that's all that they would know at that beginning point, right? right. But it, it's different. They know that, but they also attribute everything to spirits. You know, different spirits and things that, rather than thinking uh, uh, one God who they are totally accountable to. And uh, I don't claim to understand fully how it works, all of it. But all I know is God is still just. And he's and He still desires, I mean, it's not a lie, He still desires that none would perish. And at the same time, He's the one that opens. And He knows the hearts of people like we just read. He knew in the city already how many people were faithful to Him. And uh, were ready for the gospel. So he's the one in his sovereign control. Now it doesn't, at the same time, doesn't lessen our responsibility to endeavor to go out and tell them by any means. 
But at the same time, looking back in hindsight, we can't say God was limited because of man in any step. So then he goes on and continues to praise him. He said, I know thy works. And then also he says, for thou hast a little strength. As to little, see the same Greek word about Zacchaeus in Luke 19.3. He was little of stature and about the Lord's company in general, a little flock. Okay, diminutive. In Luke 12.32, the Philadelphian assembly was unimportant in the world's eyes, probably few in number, poor in property, and low in social scale. The saints are under his control. He can use the feeblest of them. And in fact, that's the, the ones he likes to use the most, probably. <clears throat> also, he says, another thing he praises him for, he says, and has kept my word and has not denied my name. They had guarded and kept the truth of God as it was committed to them and had not departed from the faith. That system of doctrine which is, was held by the apo apostolic church. The pressure today is to repudiate, distort, dilute, allegorize, or ignore the word of God. Let's read these references in 1 Timothy 6.20, 2 Timothy 1.13, Blair Jude 1.3, or Jude 3, <laughs> um, Colossians 1.23. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to their trust, avoiding profane and vain babbling, and opposition to science falsely so called. Okay. 2 Timothy 1.13. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Jude. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you for the common salvation, it was meet for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Okay. If ye continue in the faith grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which, ye, and which was preached to every creature that is under the heaven, of which I, Paul, am made a minister. Okay, so we're to keep, guard, contend for, and we, should, we see that <clears throat> the faith or his word, and they're not denying his name. And we see this is how faithful they were in Philadelphia. So he praises him for that. Praising even the idea that they had a little strength, not belittling, belittling them for that, but actually a little strength in it. And it's sometimes better to have a little than rather a lot of strength in themselves. And then uh, just that they had been faithful to his word and his name. And also that uh, their works, always their works. The problem. In verse 9, we have, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. The first part is that they are the, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. The most uh, invenerated enemy of the church of Christ were the Jews. We read of them in Thessalonica and Smyrna, and here in Philadelphia, and Smyrna, the same term, synagogue of Satan, is applied to them as here. And again, synagogue is basically the word meaning gathering together. The gathering together of Satan, or the group who gathers together. They were the synagogue of Satan. If they would have been like Nathaniel, Israelites indeed, they would have believed on the Lord Jesus and have proved themselves of the election of grace, as it says in Romans 11.5. And have been part of that assembly which, as Jews by falsehood only, they reviled. Basically, they're showing that the, they were the synagogue. They themselves were the, the ones who weren't Jews by truth. They were Jews by probably physical birth. But true, a true Jew was one who was anticipated the Lord's return. One who was like the Bereans, checked it out, and then saw it to be, to be so. Whereas they had held to the form and custom. Behold, I'll make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. In, Philadelphia, in the Philadelphian church were some who were arrogant and proud and far from the truth. But now the prospect, verses 10 to 11. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, 
which shall come upon all the earth, the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Many have observed also that the preposition from, ek, uh, is best understood as out of rather than simply from. So in the area where it says, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, it's also like I will keep thee out of, or totally removed from the hour of temptation. Other instances of the use of the same verb and preposition together, such as in John 17.15 and James 1.27. Could you read that please, John? Not John. Rick, John 17.15 and Helen, James 1.27 please. Pray not that thou should, shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Okay. And James 1.27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. It is that fathers and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So... To keep, again, that, that's the verb, and then from or out of the world. And so the, the idea, is, he says here, would indicate that it is perhaps too much to press it to, the, to mean an absolute deliverance. In other words, to be totally taken from and separated from, as in the context of those two verses. In the view of the context of the book of the Revelation, however, as it subsequently unfolds the horrors of this very tribulation period, it is evident that the promise here to the Church of Philadelphia is one of deliverance, from this time of trouble that's to come, the tribulation itself. We who believe we who believe are in the kingdom by birth, by new creation already, but both for our Lord and for us, there is a patient waiting for the kingdom setting up. And patience, connected with the saints seven times in Revelation, is a prime virtue, the waiting for. And really the saints have been waiting two thousand years for this fulfillment. This hour, which is referenced back to um, keep the from the hour of temptation, this hour coming as it will upon the whole earth is seen in Revelation 13, 7 and 8. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given over all the kindreds and the tongues and nations, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. And of course those saints it was talking about are the tribulation saints. Um, rather than the church. In the uh, permitted frightful career of the beast. So that's what's coming. In which he, he's terrorizing, overruling. And two things identified this hour. First, its extent, and second, its object. It is to come upon all the inhabited earth. It is to try the earth dwellers, whether they will follow Satan's Christ or not, since they have chosen earth, where Satan is prince and, God, and the God as their, good, as their good things. Now, our Lord promises to keep Philadelphian believers out of this coming hour. Again, ek denotes possession uh, possession out of the interior, the compass, the limits, or if anything, as the antithesis of ace, which means into, or into the midst of. So this is basically summarizing that they have kept the word of my patience, and his word is that he is coming, and they've kept it with patience. Also, I will keep thee from the hour of temptation, and we also know also tribulation too, and he's going to keep from out of that hour, uh, also to come upon the, all the world and to try them that dwell upon the earth and that's one of the reasons for the, the last part when Satan has his antichrist behold and so again too this just shows I think it's in here in the notes but again shows that the church is not going to go through the tribulation it's not to enter into it we have other passages to show this also in Thessalonians that um we're not to fear. We're not going to be going through that time. It's not for the church. We're to have our own purging, as it were, even before the uh, the judgment seat of Christ. But that's not going to be it. That's for a different reason. Yeah. 
Later also in the, the, uh, the promise is, Behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. The expression, again, quickly is to be understood as something which is sudden and unexpected, not necessarily immediate. I come quickly, suddenly. In this passage, the rapture of the church is in view. The coming of Christ to establish a kingdom on earth is later event following the predicted time of tribulation, which is unfolded in the book of Revelation itself. The language of these verses indicate a trial of universal extent. This one and the one before, that is. Not just a local outbreak of persecution in Philadelphia. Uh, we saw by that, that phrase that upon the whole world. I mean, <laughs> that's not just going to be a local thing that he's referring to. Is an assurance to the church at large that it will be kept from that hour by the Lord's coming in the sky. This is indeed a supreme example of all situations being under his control. His greatest desire is to find the feeble ones, faithful ones, who will listen to his voice. To them he unveils the secrets of his heart, and he tells them what moves to make. He wants them to win. And he tells them what to do, basically, hold fast. We noticed the other ones, it was the same thing, hold fast. It wasn't go out and conquer and uh, put down these people, but hold fast my word, hold fast the truth, you know, have patience, stand. Intensely important uh, is this warning that a crown may be lost, won or lost, to later watch, watchlessness. The Greek word for take generally indicates receiving, not seizing. Um, as 1 Corinthians 3, 8 and 14 and 4, 7 three times in a 9.24. If you want to look that up, 1 Corinthians 3, 8, Tracy, and 14. 1 Corinthians 4, 7, please, Bob. And 1 Corinthians 9.24, please, Blair. If you want to look up James 1 and 12, please. And, Hun, can you look up 2 Timothy 4, 8? Okay. Four seven. Four seven. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou did <laughs> and what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory? Okay. As and if, sorry. As if thou hadst not received it. Okay. And that word received is the same word as take care. That no man take thy crown, that no man receive thy crown. Okay, so it's not so much no man take that crown, but rip it right out of your hands because you had it, but no man that receives your crown. Okay, also in 924. Knowing you not that they who run in a race run all, but one receives the prize, so run that you may obtain. Right, receive the prize. Blessed is the man that endures. Oh, sorry. That's, that's the next section. I'm just getting you ready for it. Yeah. Also, called, can you look up First Thessalonians 2:19, Tracy? Have can you look up First Corinthians 9:25? And Blair, can you look up First Peter 5:4? So we see here, and it's interesting. Uh, though you can never lose your salvation, and we're doing a study on this before, you can lose your reward. You can lose the reward of your inheritance. You can't lose your inheritance, but you can lose the reward of it through uh, wasting your service for the Lord, being like an unprofitable servant, so that when you come before the judgment seat of Christ, it's, it's burnt up. Your labor is in vain. And uh, it doesn't affect your entrance whatsoever. It's just that it won't be an abundant entrance. So he tells him to, uh, he comes quickly, he'll come suddenly, but hold fast what you have, that no man will receive thy crown. And we can think of the, the parable that the Lord gave about um, the, the servants that he had set and gave them the talents and the one buried and the one who had met much, much was given to. And uh, the other had uh, little, even though he was, it was little. It wasn't that much of a, a chore, yet he was unfaithful because he did nothing with it. 
And I think the key there wasn't so much what it was, the amount, as the percentage, like how much. The other was they equaled it, they used it to its full potential, whereas he didn't do that. Now, intensely important this warning that a crown may be, oh, we already read that. Of the 23 times it is used in Revelation, 21 describing receiving the same word. So it's, this, is, this one word is actually receiving. So it's not take, you're going to go up to the judgment seat and all of a sudden you get this crown, but, you know, you didn't hold, hold fast certain things. Some guy's going to come up and snatch the crown from you or something. It's the idea of receiving. Now, no one will take their crown, as you also see. Uh, James 1.12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Okay. Second Timothy 4, 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all that also that love his appearing. Right. For Thessalonians 2, 19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of redemption? I'm talking about different crowns here. First Corinthians 9.25 And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an, in, an incorruptible. Okay. And First Peter 5.4 And when the chief shepherd shall appear, we shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Okay. So then, now he has a promise. In verse 12, he says, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I'll write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. The first part, part A there, the promise is three times where it says, I will. I will make a pillar, I will write, I will write. It is the divine initiative. This initiative guarantees that God will take the overcomer and make him. He will make him strong, he says. My strength is made perfect in weakness, as we saw, and they had little strength. But through that, he could use them. The Lord promises to make these feeble ones into temple pillars, the very symbol of solidarity, stability, and strength. It seems to mean that they will no longer be exposed to the temptations and trials of this present life and will have their permanent residence in the very presence of God. We are to behave as overcomers, as those who are on the victory side. We are to behave like the sons and daughters of a king and be more than conquerors in view of the divine initiative and in view of the divine... Repeat. No, oh, invitation, okay. Let us not forget in viewing these seven messages in their prophetic succession that all existed together. Remember also that all have existed through the dispensations, which I believe, so that not only is the hope of the imminent coming of the Lord preserved to all, but the promises to the overcomers are for all the saints. For example, no saint shall be hurt of the second death. Not just That's just not applying to the Smyrna saints. That's all, all who overcome. Also, it's interesting, this, this statement, um, the idea of being a pillar in the temple and shall go no more out. If you go back to uh, the um, Philadelphian history with the uh, earthquakes, what would stand after these earthquakes are the, the pillars. They were able to withstand. And so here they saw through a time of tribulation, what he just talked about, a time of shaking up, basically. And that's what they kind of called a lot the Great Tribulation, the big shake and bake at the end, <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> is um, <clears throat> the pillars stand. And so they can have confidence. They, they can see that. They realize no matter what, they stand. They're firm. Also, that they'll no longer have need to go out. Well, when there was earthquakes, they just didn't stand around and sit around. They, they took off out of the city to go out. So they could relate to this. They see stability. They see security and safety in this and in a statement. And I'll write... Upon him, the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is in which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. There are mysteries of beauty, of brilliance, and of blessing in Jesus not yet revealed, 
to a wondering 